Again, Minister, a, a regular attender at the Scottish Affairs Committee, and you're always welcome. And thank you very much for agreeing to help us out with this very short inquiry into the Fisheries Bill and its application to Scotland. Just for a record, who you are, we know who you are anyway, maybe introduce your colleague, and anything by way of a short introductory statement, Minister. Okay, I'm George Eustace, and I'm the uh, Fisheries Minister, and to my right is uh, Anne Freeman, uh, who is uh, leading uh, our work on a future fisheries policy, and is part of our um, fisheries team. But we'd like to give you a precise title, Anne, yes. so I can't remember that. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Anne Freeman. I am a Deputy Director for Domestic Fisheries and Reform within DEFRA. And as you'll be aware, that the Fisheries Bill uh, cleared committee stage shortly before uh, Christmas, and uh, we'll be um, coming back uh, for report stage. Uh, we hope at some point uh, early this year. And um, uh, I know there are lots of uh, areas you wanted to uh, cover, but in particular, uh, this does the crucial things that we need to do to become an independent coastal state again, uh, the power to uh, create and manage quota ourselves, and the power to control access to our waters and license foreign vessels to fish in our waters, as well as uh, many other issues, including um, uh, at the very front in, in Clause 1, uh, a number of very important commitments to sustainable fishing. Yep. Grateful. And that was very short and concise and very helpful. Thank you, Minister. Uh, just a, a couple of introductory questions. We, we had the Cabinet Secretary in um, front of the committee through video link um, early, uh, earlier today, and it was a, a helpful um, opportunity to ask him just about his views about the bill. There was a couple of things that emerged which maybe you could help us with. He said that he wrote to you at the beginning of December about some of the concerns the Scottish Government have had about this bill. Um, he's not received a response yet. I'm presuming that he will, obviously, a courteous minister like yourself. But is there any, anything within that correspondence that you could maybe help us with some of the issues and points that the Scottish Government have a concern? Now, I have several bits of correspondence from, um, so I'm not sure which, which were the particular issues. I know he's got an issue of Clause 18. 4th of December. 4th of December. Yeah. Maybe yes. Ms. Ms Freeman could help us with that. Yes, yeah, so um, I think the letter uh, is uh, sort of referring to, uh, makes a number of requests um, about uh, aspects that uh, Scottish Government would like us to add to the bill. Um, it also uh, raises some concerns about Clause 18 of the bill um, and seeks some clarification about those. Is that... That, that's the letter. Jim. Broadly, yes. Um, I think that must be yes, it. It is, yes. I think. So on those particular issues, then, um, firstly, we work closely with all of the involved administrations to include uh, all of the elements that they wanted in the bill. And certainly when we had our uh, initial um, discussion, um, uh, I think Wales and Northern Ireland wanted us to include uh, powers for them to have grant-making powers, to have a uh, successor scheme, for instance, to the EMFF scheme at the moment. Uh, at that point, um, the Scottish Government said they didn't want us to include those for them. Uh, our understanding was that um, they were hopeful at the time, perhaps, perhaps uh, Fergus Ewing was hopeful that they would have time in the uh, um, parliamentary planning for the Scottish Parliament to bring forward their own legislation, and that's how they intended to do it. Uh, but we understand that that, that probably now isn't the case, and they've uh, asked us, therefore, to um, include those powers for them uh, in common with uh, um, Wales and Northern Ireland at later stages of the bill. And is this something you'd be happy to entertain? Um, yes, uh, we would be. Um, there is this slight issue, though, that at the moment um, the Scottish Government is withholding yep. uh, legislative consent motions. So <clears throat> there are uh, elements here that we work with the modern or in the bill, um, but to, to actually create lots of new powers for them when they're withholding a legislative consent motion uh, does, is, is, is slightly yes. problematic. It's not, not impossible, um, but it's, it's rather uh, incongruous to be saying, can you put this in the bill and that in the bill and the other in the bill, yeah. while at the same time withholding a legislative consent motion. Now, there was a number of amendments during the committee stage of the Fisheries Bill that were provided by the Scottish Government, and I think you would have view that you couldn't accept them. Was that because of the LCM impasse, or could you give us your reasons why it, they were unacceptable to you? It was predominantly, I know last time I was in front of the committee, it was in the context of the Agriculture Bill, and um, there are certain parallels between um, you know, the nature of um, some disagreements over what is reserved and what is divorced. Yes. And um, you'll recall that in the context of the Agriculture Bill, uh, there's been lively discussion around uh, the World Trade Organization um, schedule and the powers that the UK government needs to be able to demonstrate compliance with that. Uh, and the Scottish government has some differences with us on that. Um, in the context of the Fisheries Bill, the um, primary, uh, primary concern that uh, Fergus Ewing has raised is around Clause 18. 
which simply gives the UK government, strictly for the, in the context of international negotiations, that gives them the power to um, create and set uh, yes. catch limits, so effectively to create a quota for the whole UK. Now, that's a function that's currently done by the European Union, and in future, uh, in terms of our international negotiations, both with the EU and with Norway and Faroes and Iceland, uh, we would need, as the UK, to have that ability to uh, create quota, uh, just as the EU currently does. Um, now, the Scottish Government are arguing that uh, they are obliged in any event to abide by an international agreement, uh, and I understand that argument and we don't dispute that, but the, the point is that the Scottish Government alone is not in a position to create quota for the whole of the UK, only the UK Government can do that. So it's, it's a, a very similar argument to that which we've been having on, on WTO in the context yes. of agriculture. It sounds very familiar to some of the issues that we were kicking around with the agriculture bill here. It seems like the Scottish Government have a view that because they're responsible for implementing the regulations with the UK Government that sees us as very much a reserve power. What are you doing to resolve that? Well, it's, it's very difficult, but there are lots of areas in the, uh, in the bill where we're absolutely up front that these are devolved matters yes. and uh, we're not making any attempt to interfere in that. So, and there are areas where we have some challenges through, for instance, the joint fisheries statement, yes. where we uh, all accept that there's a need for some UK-wide frameworks, but where we recognise it's devolved, and so we're going to have to just work through our differences. The, the, the outstanding issues which are contested is Clause 18 and Clause 28. Would that be right, looking at Ms Freeman? Um, I think these were the ones that were highlighted by... Well, 18, just to conclude on 18, I mean, I, I just draw the committee's attention to 18, subsection 2, which is very clear that a determination can be made only for the purpose of complying with an international obligation of the UK. So it is... Uh, explicit that it's only to be used in a reserved power context yeah. and in a, uh, when, where that exercise, that reserved power, is incontrovertible. Uh, and it goes on then to have a power to, or a, a requirement and a duty to consult uh, under 19. So Clause 19, while it doesn't, 19, yeah. doesn't require consent, uh, it does require um, a process of consultation. And indeed, that's been the norm for the last 20 years under our existing devolution settlement. We take a, uh, a UK-wide delegation to December Fisheries Council currently. Uh, Fergus Ewing attends as part of that delegation, um, speaks in the um, trilateral with the Presidency and the Commission on uh, issues that are of particular interest to the Scottish fleet. So we have quite well-established ways of, uh, of working on that. Um, clause 28... I think that was probably that me that got that wrong, Minister. It's probably right, clause okay. 18 and 19, so uh, my apologies for that. Just before we, in clause 20, I, I do want to come to clause 28, though, because... It's Clause 20 and Clause 29, which are the powers which have been given to Grand Wales and Northern yeah. Ireland. That's right, isn't it? Which, yes. according, and you, well, as you've said, that the Scottish Government were of a position not to accept. Now, what the Cabinet Secretary told us about that today, and again, we're just interested in your view in this, is because fisheries is fully devolved, the management of fish, fisheries is fully devolved, that there was no need for these powers, and the Scottish Government have got the freedom of operation <coughs> in order to create some of the... The, the issues which are contained within these clauses. Is, is that to your view? Yes. I, well, yeah, I think they, they could have, have the powers, yes. They yes. have the powers, yes. So, like, this, this, this is pretty much an erroneous issue then about the non acceptance of these powers, or, or am I missing something here? If, if they could do this anyway, why do they need to um, have these powers in this bill? Well, I think they could through secondary. So, so we understand the. 2013 Aquaculture and Fisheries Scotland Act allows them to uh, change the grant making powers. I think it's a question of just pragmatism and time, as the Minister said earlier, um, that we could legislate on their behalf to, um, to do okay. that. Uh, and that's the sort of uh, where we're having the discussions at the moment about whether we, we do do that for them. I see. So they have powers under Scottish, um, under under Scottish, Scottish legislation. legislation. Yes. Yes. But just in the context of Fisheries Bill, you feel this would be required in the face of the bill, is that? Right, yeah. um, for, the, for England. Yes. For it England. does for England, yes. yes. And I think that's also the case for um, Wales and Northern Ireland. Which is they, they have their uh, own powers as well, but again, pragmatically, they asked us to do it just for, 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 for time. Um, I've got another introductory question, which will come to me. I know Mr Ducat is keen to come in, as always, on fishery issues. <laughs> it was, I'm trying to limit my intervention, but I just wanted to clarify or seek clarification or confirmation that in Clause 19, where it says the Secretary of State must consult with the different devolved administrations. The, the word consult, I think the Cabinet Secretary earlier seemed to think that that could just be as simple as sending a letter saying, here's what we're going to do. But I, I, would, I would take that to be just the inform. I think the word consult to me always involves a dialogue back and forth. Would, it, would you agree with that? Yes, and it's something... Um, 
you know, this came up quite a lot at the um, committee stage about um, the nature of our devolution settlement. We, we don't have a federal system. Mm. We have a system where things are either devolved or reserved. And uh, there are areas where things are devolved, but where it makes sense for us to work together. And in those cases, we have memorandums of understandings, concordats, and uh, we work jointly to work through our issues. Uh, but when push comes to shove and there's a disagreement, well, then the final default is it's either devolved uh, or it's reserved. And that's how our uh, constitution works. That does create some challenges in fisheries because you have this rather uh, uneasy juxtaposition between something that is on the one hand um, fully devolved in terms of its management and enforcement, but on the other hand uh, is absolutely bound up in an international negotiation that takes place annually that is absolutely reserved. So that does create challenges, but they're not particularly new challenges. We've, we've had those and wrestled with them for at least 20 years. And we've put in place a range of uh, uh, different forums to consult and agree things jointly. So of course, and, uh, so of course as a member state of the EU, we, we, we are a member state as the UK. So that relationship between yourself and the, cab or the UK minister and the Scottish government cabinet secretary has always been there. But of course, as we come out of the EU, we come out of the CFP, both of those roles in terms of influence on the fishing industry become elevated. They do, and, uh, and that's why um, there's quite a lot of importance placed uh, in the bill on both the joint fishery statement and the, the Secretary of State <coughs> statements because uh, in, uh, in the absence of, um, uh, of an easy way to join up this contradiction between things being devolved and reserved, we, we have to put in place yeah. uh, frameworks as best we can and, and agree those, and that's what this uh, bill sets out. I think it's also Thanks. fair to say what we heard from this, the Cabinet Secretary today is just how productive and fruitful the working relationship is with your department. And Knowing you as a minister, I can understand why that would be easy and accommodating, and I think that's a really good and positive thing to hear at this committee. Can I just ask about this issue about the independent coastal state and what's in the political declaration just about access to waters? Because it seems, to me, the text seems very straightforward and clear. Within the context of the overall economic partnership, establishment of a new fisheries agreement on inter alia access to waters and quota share to be in place in time to be used for determining fishing opportunities for the first year after the transition period. Now, any reading of that, to me, and t tell me if I've got this wrong, would suggest that there will be a trade-off in terms of access to fishing waters with agreement on a, a future trade deal with the European Union. What am I reading wrong in, in that part of the political declaration? Um, I think it's simply the fact that it's, uh, this is not... Uh, it, what it describes there is a fairly normal feature. So there's a, uh, something called a framework agreement between Norway and the EU, uh, which is multi-annual and has sort of headline principles uh, that will guide the annual negotiation. And so um, recognising in any fisheries negotiation uh, that the key variables are sharing arrangements for the quota, um, the overall size of the cake, the overall size of the tack, which is driven by the science, uh, and finally uh, mutual access to one another's waters. Uh, the trade-off between who gets what share and who gets what access uh, is the crux of any fisheries negotiation. And all that uh, is really stating is a statement of the obvious, in a way, which is <clears throat> there will be a framework agreement that will have to set out um, the sharing arrangements. And we're clear that we want to depart from relative stability and move to something um, based more on zonal attachment, uh, but also access. And oh. in, a, in a nutshell, <clears throat> the headline of a future framework agreement is likely to be a presumption that they'll still enjoy some access to our waters. Yes, and, I don't uh, think there's any dispute about that, but just, yes. it's just open to so many interpretations with the French president taking his own take on all this, and he's yes. stated very clearly that in, in return for a trade arrangement and deal with the, the EU, access to UK fishing waters would be expected. So, you know, I mean, you, we've left it in this, this state and condition where it could mean anything to anybody, even though it says something very specific. Yes. I mean, what, it, what it describes, I think, is what a framework agreement for fisheries management would look like rather than a, a trading relationship. But uh, will, um, you know, will other EU countries seek to say, well, the, the price of a, uh, of a free trade agreement is you know, access to waters? Well, they might well do. But you have to bear in mind that under the withdrawal agreement, uh, the nature of the backstop uh, is that we would have full control of our waters, uh, but that there could be tariffs on, um, tariffs on our fisheries exports to the EU. Now, that is the, the bottom line uh, as things stand. And when we talk to um, uh, exporters in the um, fisheries sector, particularly shellfish, 
Uh, they're less worried really about tariffs because it's relatively low on the, on the work foods we export, it's about 8%. And in the context of exchange rate volatility, um, 8% of tariffs probably doesn't make a huge difference. It's not, it's not welcome. They'd rather it wasn't there. The, the con- thing that concerns them most is um, uh, border turbulence that affects distribution chains. Yeah. So um, when it comes down to it, um, we're in a stronger position to say, if you want to put tariffs on fish, fair enough. Uh, but um, we're going to manage our own uh, access to our own waters and we're determined to do that. Just, just lastly on this, I, mean, I think we heard from trade representatives this morning there's big political capacity building around about fisheries just now. I mean, it's probably experienced its highest profile that we've ever, except in my 18 years in the House, we've ever seen mm. as, as a feature within our, our democratic <coughs> debate. And, you know, I mean, there has been massive commitments given from this government to the fishing industry. But I'm, I remember back to the 1970s, there was a, a young lad then, and probably um, remember to call it, that there, there were a sense that the fishing industry was expendable. There was an expectation that we'd be leaving the CFP by 2019. There's a whole history and series of disappointments to the fishing industry. Why should it be any different this time? They're, they're only 0.1% of the economy. Yes, they're important politically, but in terms of the grand scheme of things, it's... They're nothing compared to the car industry, manufacturing, or the bank of, or, or banking services in London. Well, um, it is very important to certain coastal communities, uh, and very important, therefore, to uh, certain members of Parliament, uh, some of whom are around uh, at the table of this uh, committee. Uh, and therefore, it has political influence. And as someone who uh, is an advocate of leaving the European Union, uh, despite all of the uh, arguments and turbulence we're having, I would say that when you uh, bring responsibility for a policy like fisheries back home, um, Parliament steps up and uh, new checks and balances kick in and Parliament starts engaging uh, in fisheries policy in a way it's not for 40 years because things have been decided elsewhere. And I think that's a good thing uh, for our fishing industry, a good thing for our marine environment. I know David wanted to come in, but Deidre had her hand up first. Deidre, then we'll come to you, David. Yeah, Minister, I mean, I fully accept that I mean, the Cabinet Secretary spoke warmly of the relationship he enjoys with you and, and the work you do together. But I have to say, your approach with regards to tariffs sounds a little blasé, uh, if you'll forgive me saying that, but it, it does sound rather um, relaxed. And I wonder how much discussion there's been with the industry, how much sort of detailed work there's been with individuals within the industry regarding the possible impact of those, that increase in tariffs. I mean, I know, that, for example, Scottish salmon um, potentially could be looking at a big increase in tariff, and that, of course, is a huge export for Scotland, and we, uh, we would like to see that protected. So I wonder, can you just speak a little bit more about that, because that I find quite alarming. Yes, um, we've had extensive uh, discussions with industry, and rather refreshingly, actually, um, the message from the processing industry generally is, um, yes, we would rather have tariff-free access, uh, but don't sell out the catching sector on our behalf. And um, I just wish we had more uh, of that sort of mentality in other sectors of the economy. But what they're really uh, saying is those who have the highest tariffs, so processed uh, cod and fish fingers and things, um, around 90% of what they produce is sold in the UK in a way, and around 10% is exported. So they do export, but it's a small proportion. The fish that we export most of things like shellfish, and they actually have a much lower tariff of around 8%. And what those sectors are telling us is, yes, of course, they'd rather not have tariffs. Um, But if there were tariffs, provided we don't sell out our catching sector, frankly, the European Union's got nowhere else to go to get those uh, products, apart from buying them from British fishermen. So it effectively starts to become a tax on European consumers. Now, having said all of that, I should, of course, stress that the government is seeking to get a comprehensive free trade agreement where there is tariff-free access. And that's mm. what uh, the Prime Minister's withdrawal agreement and the political declaration alongside it is all about. Mm. But the reason I, I make this point is um, some people suspect that in the final analysis, when we get there, fisheries will be offered up in some way mm. and traded away. And um, the point that I'm trying to get across is uh, the way that the withdrawal agreement is uh, constructed, um, it does mean... Um, that um, in the final analysis, if we had to say we'll have tariffs on our fish just like, say, Norway and Iceland do, uh, but we'll control our fisheries, that is what we would do, and um, our industry would be able to live with that. Thank you. Give it. Um, I just wanted to, a, a very quick one, uh, on this idea that's often presented to us, uh, as you say, for those of us who represent fishing communities, 
it, it doesn't hold true that when we, t we look at the UK as a whole, the contribution to the economy is relatively small, admittedly. But when you look at it in the communities that you and I both re represent, it's very much focused in those communities. So fishing is a huge uh, part of the community in Fraserburgh, Peterhead, in, in, in your constituency as well. And so that has to absolutely be taken. In. Would you agree that that absolutely has to be taken <coughs> into account um, in terms of the economy of these focused communities rather than just the UK as a whole? Um, yes, absolutely. And I, um, <coughs> representing a Cornish uh, seat, I know what it's like to represent uh, a constituency that's a long way from London, and I know how people feel about uh, priorities of, uh, of governments that are a long way um, from London. Um, and so I'm somebody who's acutely aware of that. And obviously, um, uh, in your particular case, Mr Dugan, I think you have something like 30% of the entire UK fishing industry in your constituency, so it, it certainly matters to, uh, to Bant from Buckham. Grateful. Thanks. John Lamott. Good afternoon, Minister. Uh, my question uh, is about the preparation of um, both the Joint um, Fisheries Statement and the Secretary of State's Fisheries <coughs> Statement, and just the extent to which the devolved administrations, in particular the Scottish Government, will be involved in that process. Okay. Um, so it's very uh, clear uh, in, um, uh, I think it's in clause, clause two, is uh, um, uh, sorry, clause three is about the preparation of those, and it creates effectively a legal requirement for us to produce the joint fishery statement within certain timescales, um, and um, we can only uh, produce it uh, with the agreement of each part of the UK. So there is a legal obligation on all of us, on all administrations, to produce one, uh, but also because uh, many of the uh, aspects uh, that will be in the joint fishery statement will be devolved. Uh, in effect, uh, it will force us to work through our differences to uh, achieve a consensus. Now, that may be challenging in some areas, um, but it is something, like I said, that we're uh, used to doing. Uh, it's mm. what we've been doing for uh, 20 years with the devolution settlement that we've got. Uh, and um, that's effectively how, how the wiring of those statements work. OK. Um, and this morning on our, on our first panel, when we were speaking to... Um, industry representatives, there was a concern about um, how potential disputes might be resolved. So if, they, if you get to, you heaven forbid, where there's not goodwill on, on, both, on both sides and you are not able to get that agreed position, how, you know, what is the dispute mechanism? Well, at the moment, of course, we have um, the JMC, uh, the Joint Ministerial Committee. I know that that um, is not, uh, a lot of people would say that's got shortcomings, mm. and that's why the Cabinet Office are indeed reviewing that uh, with a view to strengthening it and improving it. Um, but ultimately, um, this came up at uh, committee stage uh, about whether there should be some sort of arbitration process or dispute resolution process. And I just think we have to be um, realistic about what um, a judge sitting on an arbitration panel is going to bring to the show. Uh, when you're in some dispute around Orkney crabs or um, some agreement on how we're going to manage blue whiting in the North Sea. Um, at the end of the day, um, the types of disputes that you'd be working through in the Joint Fisheries Statement, it's a policy statement, uh, they will be disputes around policy choices and how we <coughs> dovetail our respective policies around the UK. Mm. And I would argue that these are only things that... Um, politicians can work through. Mm. And um, on a good day, um, we, we politicians are quite good at uh, working through differences to achieve a consensus. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to return to your earlier remarks regarding um, the need or otherwise um, for a fisheries bill in Scotland. Um, we touched on this again with the first panel this morning, which was with the um, Fishermen's <coughs> Federation, Scottish Seafood Association, RSP Scot RSPB Scotland, and the National Federation of Fishermen's Organisations. And they expressed, they all expressed concern that the Scottish Government was proposing not to give the legislative consent motion to this um, bill. Um, they also said that they felt there was a vacuum from the Scottish Government in terms of fishing policy and they wanted to say that there's no real sense of direction from the Scottish Government in terms of how to take fishing forward. I mean, as someone who represents a much smaller fishing community compared to Mr Duke, I do represent some fishermen. I know there's concern in Scotland about how fishing is going to move forward. Do you share the concerns from the industry experts this morning about what the Scottish Government is doing in respect of fishing in Scotland? 
Well, at the moment, there are lots of provisions in here, including uh, provisions around how we manage um, uh, fish diseases and um, you know, biosecurity on, on the aquatic environment, um, and um, also uh, including um, powers to uh, change technical uh, regulations, which are provided for for Scotland as well, at their request. So there are lots of provisions here for Scotland that have been requested by the Scottish Government. I, mean, I think there's a, it's a rather uneasy situation at the moment because... Um, the Scottish Government's obviously taken a position uh, after the EU Withdrawal Act that it will withhold legislative consent motions for all Brexit bills as a point of principle. Um, I, I think in the case of fisheries, um, the Scottish Government, I think, dipped a toe in the water in terms of starting the process for maybe preparing a memorandum uh, with a view to possibly doing a legislative consent motion. And they've raised some objections at the moment that's held, held back that process being completed. I'm, I'm hoping uh, that once uh, this House, one way or the other, resolves the bigger question about <coughs> the nature of our leaving the EU, mm. what that's going to look like, what type of agreement or deal there will be, if any, that once one way or the other we've resolved that here, uh, it would become easier for the Scottish Government at that point to say, now we know where we stand on this and things have been decided, uh, and therefore it makes sense for us to, to agree a legislative consent motion and return to business as usual. Mm. So I think it's complicated by the fact that we're, we're not in a sort of business as usual mode in terms of our relationship with the Scottish Government because of the, uh, the, the big elephant in the room, which is obviously the, the wider Brexit argument. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Christine Jardin. Good afternoon, Minister. It's nice to see you again. Um, can I ask, why doesn't this bill place a legal duty on the UK fisheries administrations to meet the fisheries objectives? Um, it does in the sense that it's, um, there are fisheries objectives in, in one which are set out mm -hmm. and there's then a legal requirement um, in uh, the fisheries statements, the joint fisheries statement, to spell out how we intend uh, to meet that. The nature of the clause, the wording in clause <coughs> 1, uh, is literally, with one or two uh, exceptions, cut and paste from the European regulation. So we're bringing mm -hmm. across uh, the environmental objectives that are in the current CFP and mm -hmm. putting them right at the front of the uh, bill. Um, the difficulty with having, um, uh, and this has come up with some of the uh, NGOs, green NGOs, mm -hmm. and it's a complex area, but the difficulty in having a very rigid commitment to fish every stock at MSY um, a maximum sustainable yield, which is mm -hmm. the general yardstick used, is that sometimes the um, environment will change uh, in a way that you have so-called choke species. It's a big issue at the December Council this year. It's a big problem in the west of Scotland, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, unless you're going to tie up your entire fleet, there will be times <coughs> when you'll have to make some sort of bycatch provision for some species. Mm -hmm. That means that species in that year won't be fished at MSY. Um, likewise, uh, there will be times in a mixed fishery, we have this problem in the Celtic Sea in uh, the West Country, where you have uh, whiting and haddock and cod that will all be at different levels of uh, um, 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 health, um, uh, ecological health, but where you have to try and pitch all of them within ranges to ensure that in that mixed fishery um, you're not damaging any stock too much, but, but some of them might go out of an MSY range. And the third problem, uh, is that we have to reach agreements with our neighbours, whether it's EU or whether it's Norway. And Norway in particular, which is um, of particular relevance to Scotland, uh, Norway follows maximum sustainable yield, but that's only one of their measures. Okay. And they also have other approaches to uh, uh, science and other yardsticks that they use. And they would argue that their approach is better than ours. Now, if they had an approach that, um, uh, that they argued was better, and we could reach an agreement were it not for some piece of legislation that would make it unlawful for a minister to do it. Um, you have to ask the question, in such a scenario, is it better to do the deal and have an agreement with Norway about how we sustainably manage stocks, or is it better to walk away and just unilaterally do our own thing? And I would say it's always the, the former, even if that means that there are occasions when certain stocks might, be, might not be fished in MSY. So what we um, provide for is very clear objectives that we are committed to and a legal objective and a legal requirement to have a plan that shows how we're going to deliver on those but with sufficient flexibility to recognise those realities. Difference. Okay. And what recourse would the fishing sector have if they felt that the administrations weren't meeting those objectives? 
Well, either um, uh, NGOs, um, you know, environmental NGOs would be uh, probably more likely to do it because they're quite uh, uh, litigious uh, often, uh, but um, either them or the fishing industry or anybody else would obviously be open to uh, bring a judicial review uh, against the government um, or any administration to say that they weren't abiding by the joint fishery statement. There's one thing I'm, I'm curious about, <coughs> and that's that um, the face of the bill it doesn't have the transition period ending as the commencement date for policy. Now, what could the implications of that be if we get to the end of the transition period and there's no agreement? Well, the uh, clause on um, commencement, uh, the number of which I can't remember, but it's right at, right at the end, 40, yes, 40, um, 45 uh, at the moment. Um, that, um, in most cases, there are one or two that are moved on a uh, set point, but in the vast majority, they're to be moved by order. And um, there was an amendment at the committee stage uh, that sought to say that um, the deadline for mm -hmm. commencing the provisions of the bill would be December 2020. Um, the, uh, and that was uh, put down by, by Mr. Zugid, and there were other amendments put down by, by other members. The impact of that would be that it would, make it, it would fetter the ability of um, a future government to uh, exercise the option of extending the implementation period. It wouldn't make it impossible, uh, but there would need to be uh, subsequent primary legislation to uh, obviously delay the commencement of the bill if there was an extension of the implementation period, if fisheries was, uh, was included. Now, I know um, uh, for very understandable reasons, that's precisely why the uh, amendment was, uh, was put down, because from the perspective of the fishing industry, um, the implementation period can't end soon enough. Um, mm -hmm. It will always be uh, preferable, from the narrow point of view of the fishing industry, always preferable to be in the so-called backstop with all its uh, uh, um, um, contentious uh, features, but always preferable for fishing to be in the backstop than to be in an implementation period. If you'll forgive me with respect, that takes us back to the point that the Chair made about them, might there not be a suspicion amongst the fishing community that the reason is not there? is that perhaps the commitment <coughs> to the fishing industry isn't as great as it might be to other sectors? Well, um, the point I would make is the reason, the reason it's not there in the way the bill was drafted um, is that second reading of the bill took place before we had uh, concluded the withdrawal agreement. So um, it was less clear at that point what the nature of the implementation period would be, indeed what the nature of the withdrawal agreement would be. So it's because of the uh, elements of doubt about, about that that we didn't have anything in the bill. Um, uh, the reason that it's not in there now and the reason um, that we've so far uh, resisted that amendment at committee is that it would fetter the, the option that the government has sought through the withdrawal agreement to be able to uh, extend that implementation period for a, a few months if that were considered necessary. Thank you. John Lament. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Fisheries management and support has been one of the areas which the government has identified as possibly needing a um, common framework. And I just wondered why the bill didn't, didn't make any reference to that. Could you explain what you mean by fisheries management? Uh, it, it, in terms of, well, I guess it's um, quota setting and, and um, the support that the fishing communities might get. I think the government previously had identified that as being an area where we need a common framework across the whole of the United Kingdom. Yes. Uh, but there's no specific mention of that on the face of the bill. So I think um, in terms of, of when we identified, uh, I think you're talking about work that was published a long time ago. Right, OK. Um, and I think the work by the Cabinet Office, um, and it, it, it had fisheries down as an area where we might need a framework. I think the position has moved a lot since then. We absolutely do need a framework. Mm -hmm. um, we've been working very closely with devolved uh, colleagues about that. It's the question about how you deliver that framework. Okay. And I think, um, as the Minister has said, we've got a very good, close working relationship with the development administration, particularly Scotland in this case, and um, we've concluded that actually lo a lot of this, you don't need a legislative framework, and it would be in inappropriate to put in a legislative <coughs> framework um, for matters that don't aren't covered by uh, legislation. So we would uh, are seeking to develop a memorandum of understanding uh, which would cover matters like quota allocation and decisions on fisheries management issues where uh, it impinged on a sort of shared stock or a, a sort of um, territory, border territory. Um, so I think 
frameworks don't necessarily need to be legislative and uh, we would much rather uh, move forward by cooperation and collaboration than legislating. But in terms, um, if your question was more around um, coastal communities and fishing opportunities, mm. we, we set out, so there's the joint fishery statement which is predominantly around the sustainability objectives in clause one. But we also um, make a provision for what we call a Secretary of State statement, which would be a predominantly England uh, statement. And that deals with um, socio-economic factors for coastal communities. And uh, indeed, <coughs> during our committee stage, we gave uh, an undertaking to consider whether we could make that more explicit around fishing opportunities, in particular reference to the, the inshore under 10 fleet. Uh, and also uh, whether we could consider things such as um, angling interests as well within those uh, that particular statement. Now that statement, as I said, would be pretty <coughs> a, an England statement. And I know, um, you know the, the point's been raised previously, what about Scotland? And mm -hmm. it would be for the Scottish Government to, to have a, a statement, a similar type of statement, okay. if it wanted to, uh, to address mm -hmm. socio-economic uh, mm -hmm. socio issues in Scotland. Perfect. Thank you. Jed Killen. Good afternoon. Thank you. Minister, when you previously gave evidence to the committee, you said that uh, fishing licences for foreign vessels would be issued by the UK Government on behalf of all devolved administrations. The Bill, however, says that devolved administrations will be responsible for issuing licences for their respective zones. Has there been a change in the policy? Um, there hasn't been a change in policy, but it, it's, a, it's a complex area. But it is one where I believe we've arrived at a... Um, uh, at, a, at a sensible, um, it's not, not, not final yet, but uh, the direction of travel is a sensible conclusion. And I'll just explain how this works. In terms of negotiating access for foreign vessels to, the, to uh, UK waters, that is clearly reserved and only the UK government can do. And once the UK government has made that decision, there's therefore a legal obligation on the other administrations to license those vessels. And the conversation we've been having uh, with the devolved administrations is that for understandable reasons, because licensing is devolved, um, they haven't wanted to um, explicitly give up that power to license because it's part of the devolution settlement. Now, why would they uh, give that up? But equally, they understand that it's a, um, in practice, when it comes to foreign vessels, there's a legal requirement on them to issue the license anyway. So it's a rather circular argument. And what we are moving towards, I think, is an administrative um, solution where, with the consent uh, of the devolved administration, a, singular license, a single license might be able to be issued by uh, the MMO on behalf of everyone, provided they gave their consent. Now, from the point of view of um, other devolved administrations, that saves them the unnecessary administrative burden of issuing duplicate licences um, over which they'd have no discretion in any event. Uh, and it means we can have the clarity of a, a single UK licence, but it would be done through um, an administrative agreement rather than by a statutory requirement. So it's, it doesn't really sound as though there is actually any point in the devolved administrations having this, this ability to licence. If you're saying there's no, no, no flexibility, they, they won't be able to impose different criteria on foreign ships okay. to the rest of the UK, for example. Uh, can so, they on foreign vessels? So they will be able to, yes. They so, they, so they could, but they couldn't, um, so, as so long as it didn't cut across the international in, agreement. Indeed, yes. indeed. But as the Minister says, the agreement about whether or not uh, access will be allowed is a UK reserved matter. Obviously, we'll take into consideration the, the views of the devolved administrations. But the actual issuing of a licence is a devolved function. We are preserving that. But as the Minister says, administratively, it makes sense to allow people to uh, just to, to have a single issuing authority for that for that license, but within that there can be different license conditions. But, but fundamentally, I think we have to recognise that the the devolved settlement we have, um, in the context of being members of the EU and the CFP, meant that devolved administrations could issue licences to their own fleets, and that was always the intention. And nobody ever had to issue a licence to an EU vessel since they had um, they had the right to operate anyway. And in the case of Faroese vessels operating in Scottish waters, UK waters, uh, those licences were uh, granted by the EU on our behalf. <clears throat> so um, historically, they were predominantly issuing licences to their own fleet. And um, we are obviously in a slightly new territory and they were issuing licences to foreign vessels. And I think we've reached a, a reasonable compromise, which is since licensing is devolved, uh, we won't legally take that power away. 
but it is it is a power that is better exercised administratively with a single license. Could, by just the just UK. to clarify, because I think it's quite a point that we don't mention. Yeah. It's, so the UK government will therefore license foreign vessels on behalf of the Scottish government at their request. Yes. It wouldn't be the case that you would, that the UK government would just say, like, this is what we're allowing into Scottish waters. So there will be an arrangement with. Uh, Scottish ministers yes. about access to those waters. Is that is that correct? That's yeah. right. So the the we would be issuing a license on, on their behalf, behalf of with the their consent. Right. <coughs> um, but the um, the slight um, circular nature of this argument is, um, um, except that uh, if the UK government, for instance, reached an agreement with the Faroes that granted them access as part of an international agreement, the Scottish government wouldn't be able to uh, object to that since it's an international agreement. So it becomes a rather circular um, argument. And is that likely? Is that, I mean, this it's a very unlikely because what actually will happen in practice is um, there will be a, in future a, a UK Faroes uh, bilateral. And um, we will um, take a UK delegation in the way that we do currently to December Council. And um, I would anticipate that um, we, would, we would reach an agreement that Scottish officials and the Scottish Government um, had been part of uh, devising. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to follow up on that, then, how will you enforce the UK EEZ mm-hmm. to ensure that foreign investors only fish in the zones that they have been licensed for? So we have uh, mechanisms for doing that already. Uh, so, uh, for instance, there's currently an agreement uh, with the Faroes that they, uh, I think, can catch up to 30% of their mackerel quota uh, in UK waters, and we have uh, well-established procedures uh, for monitoring their catch records. Uh, for looking at their fishing activity um, and making sure that uh, the nature of the activity reconciles with the uh, catch records that they are filing so that we can uh, actually um, uh, enforce properly that they are catching what they say they are catching in UK waters. So we already have those, um, those procedures in place. Um, Marine Scotland has its own uh, enforcement capacity, its own uh, patrol vessels. And in England, we use the Fisheries Protection uh, Squadron um, under the, uh, the agreement we have with the Royal Navy. And we've taken a decision to retain the three uh, Fisheries Protection vessels that have been due to be decommissioned, while adding an additional four new ones coming into service. And we've also boosted capacity by um, entering a, a joint agreement with the uh, Border Force, who've got four cutters, and their staff have been retrained so that they can also do fisheries protection work. Thank you. David Jicken, did you want um, to come in? Yeah, I wanted to come in on the previous question that uh, Mr Killen asked about licensing, but on the, on the latter point you made about the UK delegation, there would still be a UK delegation going to Faroes, for example, and the Scottish Government would be well represented, and presumably the Shetland Fishermen's Association would be well represented as well in that discussion based on recent... Uh, I um, think in that particular discussion, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but going back to the uh, earlier question about the consent, there has been, I believe there's been a, a little bit of confusion over the word consent in this, in this context, and I just wanted to clarify that with the devolved administration's consent, comma, the UK government will uh, release licences on their behalf, as opposed to requiring devolved administration's consent at each and every licence. Is that the case? Or is there still a case where a devolved well, administration might say, no, you can't? Give the, precise detail, um, is, uh, the precise detail is still to be worked through. But, <clears throat> but broadly speaking, I think what, we, what we're saying is that as, a point of, as a point of constitutional principle, uh, licensing will remain devolved. And so there's nothing in the bill that cuts across the devolution settlement. We've been very careful in the drafting of the bill uh, to ensure that with all of the um, sometimes awkward uh, compromises that requires, that we, we, we've sat the bill squarely within our devolution settlement. Um, however, um, effectively, administratively, you know, the UK will do it uh, on behalf, as a single licence on behalf of, of the UK. So there won't be a change to the devolution settlement, no. uh, but in practice uh, it will probably be delegated to the so UK. It's, so it's almost entirely a matter of administrative convenience rather than any kind of... Yes. I think everybody recognises that administratively it makes sense to have a single licence issued by the UK for foreign vessels. Okay. Um, And so that's administratively the sensible thing to do. But equally, the devolved administrations were anxious not uh, to diminish the current settlement they already have. And so it doesn't legally cut across that settlement. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Dietrich Brock. Yeah, um, you've already, in fact, referenced the uh, issue of access to waters being linked to future 
trade agreements, and we did hear quite a lot of concern expressed about that this morning from the Cabinet Secretary, and indeed one of the Scottish Government civil servants referred to the EU Council statement that spoke of demonstrating particular vigilance in protecting fishing interests and building on existing access. So how relevant are the powers in the bill, in light of that, um, to control access for foreign vessels? Um, very, and they're very relevant, uh, because um, once we leave the European Union and become an independent coastal state, mm -hmm. uh, no foreign vessel will be able to access uh, the UK EEZ unless they have a licence to do so. Right. So you're absolutely confident, because I'm just, it, it does concern a lot of people that you, in the face of, as, as the Chair has already said, the significant interests with much larger contributions to the GDP than fishing, um, that fishing may well be drowned out, the, the voice of fishing will be drowned out in the clamour from those particular interests. Well, um, I would simply say that we, we know what other countries um, that are not in the European Union do. Uh, we know what happens with the Faroes and Iceland and Norway. Um, they have control of their EEZ, and they're not e some of them in the EEA, uh, but they don't, um, they don't automatically grant access to their waters. Uh, that is subject to annual negotiation. Yeah. So what we're asking isn't something that's um, unrealistic or unheard of and couldn't possibly be done in the modern world. It's what happens uh, with every other normal country that's not a member of the European Union. Thank you. Thank you. Shepherd. Uh, for the Minister, good to see you again. Um, I, I, I want to go back to, uh, if I may, to uh, Clause 18 and the question of legislative consent, just explore that a little further. Um, the others have remarked that we had uh, the Cabinet Secretary uh, with us with a video link this morning and quizzed him on this. And I think, it, um, I think it's fair to say that um, even under a slightly provocative question from some of your colleagues, he seemed very wary about being drawn into uh, any stance that might be described as pugilistic, and he was uh, talking in very warm and conciliatory terms about the relationship that's been developing between your department and, and, and his. Uh, so, you know, and, and I think we're all very delighted that this love is taking place at, uh, at, at this level. I want to know. How, therefore, what is the end game in this process? Because at the minute, we do appear to have a, a big impasse. And I'm wondering how you see it getting through it. I mean, Clause 18, uh, it, you know, the, the biggest single thing about fishing, surely, is how many you can catch. I mean, that, that, there's nothing bigger than that. And at the moment, Clause 18 is pretty much saying that the determination about how many fish can be caught in Scotland will be made here. I know they're talking about consultation, but nonetheless, that is pretty much as it stands. And the Scottish Government is saying that, and, and you're under, the reason why you say that, I know, is because you say it's solely the UK's, UK Government's responsibility to comply with international treaties, and the TAC is going to have to be set in line with those international obligations. I get that. But you said earlier that um, the Scottish Government argues that it, it has to abide by international treaties too. It's a little stronger than that, actually. The Scotland Act places an obligation on the Scottish Government to deliver on international treaties that the UK, which it is part of, has signed up to. So, given that, do you see any way of squaring the circle and trying to look towards a, a revision of Clause 18 or some codicil around it that will, that will go some way to giving the Scottish Government the reassurances that it wants, which are that when it comes to setting quarters the number of fish catchable in Scotland, uh, it's going to have some serious input into determining that. Um, I can say that it, it, obviously it will have uh, serious input in determining that because Clause 19 has a requirement to consult. And if I can say something about how we approach the December Councils, it's been commented on I think by Fergus himself and indeed the Cabinet Office are looking at what we have done in DEFRA on fisheries specifically because it is a rather unique model um, in, uh, uh, within the UK in that we take a delegation that's got representatives from each part of the UK. This is a convention that the last Labour government started in around, I think, 2007 or 2008. Uh, but it was um, in those days, in an era when there was a Labour administration in every, well, in three parts of the, uh, of the UK. And you can imagine how much easier it is to try to get an agreement when you've got the same party in power in three of the four parts of the UK. 
That, um, that's not the case now. We've got very different administrations uh, in every part of the UK, and indeed in one we have no administration at all. But that said, we've persevered with the model. And I think it's been a great success. And yes, there are times when we have to have very difficult conversations and work through our differences. But I think it really does, it really does work. You just have to apply yourself to, to doing that. So in the context of the annual fisheries negotiations where those limits will be determined, um, Fergus Ewing will be alongside me in those negotiations. And um, I would simply, though, keep coming back to what I said, is that subsection 2 couldn't be more explicit that a determination made under subsection 1 may be made only for the purpose of complying with an international obligation of the United Kingdom to determine the fishing opportunities of the United Kingdom. So it's very much in terms of the global, um, the, you know, the global tack for the whole UK. And only the UK government can do that. That's the, the point that we're making in terms of legally creating the quota that reflects uh, an international agreement that the UK has entered into. The UK is the only ones who can do that. Uh, for the UK? For the UK, In yes. terms of the total, I understand that. But when it comes to determining how that TAC is... Uh, is, is, is split up within the UK, uh, are you, I mean, do I take it from what you're saying that that in itself might be uh, subject to a, a common frameworks approach with representation from the, the, the four governments? Well, we're not seeking to make any change at all uh, in that regard. So just in terms of what happens now, uh, we have our um, annual December negotiation with the EU where the uh, total allowable capture is decided, and within that the EU gives the UK an envelope uh, of quota. And what we currently do is we allocate that out to each of the devolved administrations uh, along the lines of FQA units, so based on uh, where the vessels are registered, and Scotland then manages that quota. Now, as it happens, uh, Scotland and all the other parts of the UK then themselves go on to hand it out along FQA lines, but there's no requirement for them necessarily to do that. And indeed, uh, Richard Lockhead, a few years ago, when he was uh, uh, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, had um, considered the idea of departing from uh, an FQA basis for distributing fishing opportunities in Scotland. So we're not suggesting any change. Um, we basically allocate, the UK government was always allocated, uh, quota out to the devolved um, administrations. And we're not suggesting any change to that at all. How would you feel about a proposal that said that if you were to suggest any change, that that should be subject to the consent of the Scottish Government? Well, um, at the moment, it's something that is done um, uh, on, I mean, because it wouldn't be just the Scottish Government, it would be all, you know, obviously every part of the, uh, of well, the UK. Well, the affected administration. But at the moment, I think um, we're in a period where there's a lot of change, and so we're saying that on that particular aspect, uh, where the UK Government uh, simply allocates out those fishing opportunities, um, we're not proposing any um, change uh, at all in the way the UK Government and the basis for which we do that, which is a, um, a prerogative power that's uh, always been used. It's an sort of administrative well, power that's always been used. I, I, I get you're not proposing any change, but, you know, somebody might do it next week. So, you know, it, it, unless we write these things down, just saying that you're not proposing any change now isn't really much of a guarantee for the future. So what about a situation where saying that if there were to be changes in the future, these changes would have to be subject to the consent of the devolved administrations? Yeah, and I'm going to ask Andy yes. because the white so, paper did cover them. So, so in, in, in the white paper, as the, as the minister has described, we we set out that uh, existing quota we have no um, uh, don't propose to change the way it's done. For any new quota, we will be looking at ways in which we. Uh, allocate the quota at UK level in a different way. We will need to uh, start a conversation with devolved administrations, with the industry, with stakeholders about that. And then also in England we will be allocating that additional quota to English vessels in a different way. So um, at the moment the methodology is set out uh, in the quota management rules that are agreed between the administrations. Um, it's worked perfectly well in the past where we have been able to come to an agreement about how we will allocate the quota at UK level. So I think the question is, in this future where we are hoping that we will collaborate, continue to collaborate, why would we need to legislate uh, for something that is already happening? There are established mechanisms for agreeing how you allocate quota and established mechanisms for changing that in future if you wanted to. Okay, I rather fear that answer has given me 
more evidence for my for my, for my proposition. Actually, which is, I mean, I, I I understand this debate about uh, you know you treat the existing quota, and then if there's to be an additional quota, you might look at new criteria, uh, how that would be distributed rather than the old criteria. And I I understand that's in the context of this debate about how much quota should go to what size of vessel and what size of uh, of fleet uh, with, within the the industry. Now that begs another question: of what if in Scotland? Uh, they wish to adopt different criteria in terms of the proportion of catch that should go to boats under 10 metres, for example, uh, than, the, than the view that was taken in England because of the different circumstances of the, the, the fleet or, or, or whatever. Well, they can do, would, they would, can do would, that. But, would, yeah. but, but you seem to be suggesting that actually those decisions would be taken on a UK-wide basis no, no, and so then <laughs> form part of the allocation that would be given they, to they the can do. They can do that now. And indeed, um, Richard Lockett consulted on, on doing that, and that's why there was a, a, you know, a difficulty with the Concordat, because some of the fleet sought to move um, south of the border, and it caused a um, contentious issue at the time. Um, the, um, so the, the flow of quota goes as follows. There would be an international negotiation where uh, a UK share of a total allowable catch for a stock was agreed. Uh, the UK would then um, uh, apportion that envelope up to different parts of uh, the UK following um, FQA lines, as we do now, uh, with no change to that methodology. And it is then for the devolved administrations to decide how they allocate it thereafter. There's no obligation on them to um, continue to um, share it out along FQA lines. Uh, it's already open to the Scottish Government, even now, uh, to say, well, we're going to top slice uh, that uh, FQA approach and give more, for instance, to the inshore fleet. That's a, an option that they have now. Okay. Can I... I, I don't want to, one final question? Yes, My course. last one, uh, which is that uh, uh, you, you referred earlier, Minister, to the fact that the, the, the Scottish Government now is in a situation, generally with regard to legislative consent motions regarding Brexit, of, of, of feeling, well, what, what's the point anyway? Uh, given that our consent uh, may, be, may be required, but if we don't give it, there is no consequence to that. The UK government is going to pursue it, what it wants to do anyway. Could you just, for the record, clarify that it is your, um, your wish and your policy uh, to try and achieve the consent of the Scottish Government in matters relating to the fisheries bill? Yes, of course. Um, and so the basic approach uh, with, all of these, uh, with all of these bills uh, is that they're... Um, where there are elements of the bill that obviously affect um, um, you know, parts, uh, other parts of the UK and the devolved settlement, then we should seek a legislative consent motion. Uh, and we've done that. So we wrote to Fergus Ewing requesting a legislative consent motion, as we did the other devolved administrations. And um, we're in the usual discussion uh, about that. I would still hope that we can get a legislative consent motion uh, in the end. But you know, you'll be aware that the... the um, the form here is that we should seek it uh, in, uh, in good faith and should seek to uh, accommodate requirements where necessary in order to get it, but also that it shouldn't be uh, unreasonably withheld. And I would simply say that I think in the context of the current Brexit debate that's going on, uh, there's obviously uh, a lot of highly charged politics around a really big decision. And um, I know that the Scottish Government's taken a position as a point of principle to withhold legislative consent motions from uh, Brexit bills. And as I said, I'm, I'm hoping that once we resolve the, uh, the big overarching question, uh, we'll actually uh, find it much easier to return to business as usual. Because I don't, uh, I personally don't think that the, the, the objectives, uh, the objections that uh, Fergus uh, has raised are uh, insurmountable. And certainly, I'll be uh, more than happy to spend time sitting down with him, talking him through uh, the various bits uh, of the bill, the clauses that he's concerned about, uh, to demonstrate that. Um, the way these will be used uh, is, uh, you know, is entirely uh, in order and uh, does nothing whatsoever to compromise the devolution settlement. Oh, okay. Just on quotas, and that was just something that came up again in the session with the Cabinet Secretary, and it's just about the powers on quotas in Clause 18. Does that mean that this power can be used to impose quotas on currently non-quoted stock, like Orkney Crab? That was a, the specific example that came up. Is, is that well, the understanding? Okay. I'm going to ask that. So, it's Teddy. so there are some. Um, go on. And so, so as the minister has been saying, you know, clause 18.2 is is specific. It's about international. Uh, yes. International. I understand all that. And and so for for species like uh, Orkney crab, you know, it's not a, it's not a shared stock yeah. uh, with anyone else. It's not 
uh, there are no international this, obligations the, there. So, no, we wouldn't be doing that. Right. If there so were the, to be an international obligation... Right. So yes. you would not impose quotas through this power on no. non-quota species? That's no. fine. That's but if I could just, just to clarify, there's, uh, fisheries is always a complex. So there's, there's the Western Waters regime, yes. which governs, uh, for instance, crabs and, and scallops, and some of the Scottish fleet uh, target crabs and scallops. Yep. And uh, those are subject to an international um, negotiation. Yeah. Uh, but then you have in England and in Scotland um, local uh, uh, technical measures yeah. that are just for that uh, right. particular. No, no, that's research. fine. I just wanted to clarify that was the case with Positive. Didri Brock. Um, I just wanted to go on to sustainability um, in the industry. And I wondered how the government squares its amendment uh, that ensure that UK fishers get a greater uh, share of fishing opportunities than inside the uh, common fisheries policy, um, and, and how that stacks up against the Bill's objective to base fisheries management policy uh, on the best scientific advice available. Um, that's um, fairly straightforward. So that uh, new clause that we've added uh, is um, uh, simply placing uh, in statute what is government policy, uh, which is a, uh, it makes it now a legal commitment to um, pursue the objective Mm -hmm. of only uh, continuing to grant uh, access to the level that it's um, um, agreed today uh, if there is a clear um, reciprocal commitment uh, to increase the uh, share of the catch that the UK gets. And we've been clear consistently that we'd like to move to something closer to zonal attachment. It doesn't affect the overall total allowable catch. Uh, what it means is that the share of that total allowable catch uh, will be uh, a larger share for the UK uh, in future, mm -hmm. and uh, on some stocks, on most stocks in some cases, and a smaller share for uh, some of the EU uh, fleet. Okay, so why, so why is it the government's decided not to replicate the um, CFP's commitment to uh, achieve a <coughs> maximum sustainable <coughs> yield of fish stocks by 2020? What was the decision behind that? Well, um, largely it's a, um, a legal drafting point, which is um, this bill um, won't be commenced uh, until after 2020. So uh, Parliamentary Council, for perfectly <laughs> understandable reasons, said uh, it would be rather ridiculous to have a target that's relapsed before the bill even commences. Mm. Uh, what we um, intend to do is, through the Joint Fisheries Statement, uh, which will uh, set out, uh, obviously, how we intend to uh, deliver maximum sustainable yield, that statement will be the right place to say uh, when and how we intend to uh, achieve MSY on a range of different stocks. And it could be different for different stocks. OK. And so we can't expect it on the face of the bill, then? I don't think it's right to put it on the face uh, of the bill simply because um, an arbitrary target uh, for all species um, mm. actually doesn't really work. Uh, the, the point about maximum sustainable yield is stocks will um, come in and out of that range depending on uh, factors, some of them natural environmental factors. Yes. The important thing is that you're pursuing um, sustainable fishing uh, on all stocks um, uh, uh, consistently. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Christine Jardin. No? No, don't All right, so. well, that helps us out. Hugh Gaffney. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's all right. Sorry, I'll just catch up. Uh, and supporting coastal communities... The Scottish Government have requested that the bill be amended to ensure that Scottish, Scotland maintains the same level of funding currently provided by the Europe, European Maritime Fisheries Fund post-Brexit. So will Scotland still receive the same level? Well, um, we've obviously there's a spending review a period about to take place um, uh, this year, and that will set out uh, the Treasury's approach to funding in a whole uh, range of areas. But we have already announced some additional money in the current uh, EMFF uh, round to uh, support uh, fishing communities. And you know, we make explicit provision in the bill um, to um, have powers to put in place successor grant schemes. So um, I think I made the point in committee that it, it, before you ask for sort of guarantees of funding, it might, it might make sense to make sure you've got the, the legislation to pay the grants, and that's what the bill's about. Uh, the, uh, the amount of money that you therefore put behind those after is less, I would say, a matter for the bill, more a matter for uh, the spending review. So can you say then how will you allocate the funding to the new grant schemes between the devolved administrations? Well, it would be based on the existing payments. I, I, um, I personally would see that in the uh, early years, uh, at least, you would have uh, uh, something that was um, relatively uh, close and familiar to the uh, EMFF scheme. And this might be uh, a type of scheme that would uh, evolve and develop 
over time as we um, all found our feet. Uh, but certainly um, in fisheries, it is vital, in my view, uh, that we continue to have uh, grant support to support investment in more selective uh, gears. Uh, if we want to fish more sustainably, we have to be continually refining uh, selective uh, fishing, and that requires us to be willing to uh, put our money where our mouth is and support fishermen uh, in that regard. And obviously, with the opportunities that come with uh, leaving the European Union, uh, we also need to make sure we've got the right infrastructure in uh, our ports and harbours, uh, and that um, we support coastal communities to put in place uh, that infrastructure to deal with the fish that are going to be landed. I know you have to come in, so just one last question, and it's in the <coughs> sea fish levy, and I note in the Fisheries Committee that you opposed an amendment which suggested that this would be reviewed and looked at. Is, was there any good reasons that you could give to this committee why you did that? I know it's a, uh, a long-standing position of the, of the SNP, and so I know it's, um, again, something that the Scottish Government wanted to uh, table, but this was looked at uh, in some detail by the Smith Commission, and uh, they concluded that uh, the sea fish levy should remain a UK-wide levy. They looked at it and considered the case for devolving it. Uh, but what was done at that point was a, um, uh, a special uh, Scottish committee, a subcommittee of sea fish was created. Uh, there are Scottish representatives on the main board of sea fish. They're very influential. Uh, but there is also a subcommittee of sea fish that deals specifically with Scottish issues. And our argument is that um, uh, that actually addresses um, um, the um, request that Scotland had to have more uh, influence over the way the sea fish levy is uh, uh, spent on Scotland, and it would um, not be appropriate to, to break up a levy board with all of the uh, costs and disruption that I mean, would cause. I can understand why the Scottish Government have concerns, so just looking at some of the figures which are attached to the sea fish levy and how that is then distributed across the United Kingdom. You were amenable to a, an amendment, a successful amendment in agriculture bill in the red meat levy. I mean, is it not the same type of principle that applies to that? I mean, um, I know the Red Meat Levy was, was discussed in the Smith Commission too, and but we seem to get beyond that particular hurdle. Surely we can do something with the Sea Fish Levy so that you know, some, of this, some of this funding can get back to Scotland. Well, um, it's a slightly different situation in that the, the issue with the Red Meat Levy is that, uh, which was the current arrangement was requested, obviously, by the devolved administrations, but then with the closure of some abattoirs, they found that a lot of the livestock were crossing the border. Uh, that's not really um, the issue with the sea fish levy. It's uh, collected uh, nationally and it's uh, managed nationally. And what we're really saying is um, the fact that there is a, uh, a subcommittee, a Scottish subcommittee dedicated specifically to Scottish interests, uh, means that um, you know, they are, um, um, have, a, have a huge role in directing the way that money is spent. And there's certainly no suggestion um, that um, Scottish levy money is being spent on the uh, English fleet, for instance. And yet the sense that we were probably finished and exhausted with trying to pursue that one. But I know you have to go, Minister, but we're very, very grateful for your attendance today to help us out this very short inquiry. If mean, there's anything else that you feel you could usefully add and provide to help us with this, please provide that information. But thank you again for your attendance and your, your way that you take the questions. So thank you for that too. And order, order.